Have you ever, um, I'm sure you have actually, but <clears throat> ever observed or been moved by the movement of a flock of birds or a school of fish? You know, they all undulate and, s- and sink. <clears throat> What is it that synchronizes their their uh, movement? You know, what is it? What is it that connects them? You know, we you can hear the words "We are one," but until When that's your reality, even for a moment, then there's understanding. It's not a belief or a concept, but it's an actual kind of revelation or recognition. We can talk about that, you know, here, where the spirit is so vibrant, and it's easier to tune in to that connectedness. <clears throat> but how can we stay? How can we allow that to be the foreground of our perception so we don't get caught in the beliefs and the dogma and the concepts about it? You know? How can we stay alive and fresh in the moment so that we're really available Recognize the connection that we are with everything. That oneness, that presence, that divine nature, if you will. So what I have to offer is a more to fill your head or to cause more grasping but really more just to find out how do you arrive here right now how do you find this moment how can you be available and even vulnerable to or intimate with being right here. I think we get so caught up in our thinking, planning, and busyness that we lose touch with even being alive and as a body. Do you know? Until it starts to hurt or gives us gets our attention somehow. There's a way of doing that, doesn't it? You noticed? <laughs> kind of forced into being aware. I was just enjoying, and every time I've come here, I have to say, I so enjoy deeply, profoundly being here. Something very wonderful here. So it's just, I thought, okay, I'm just going to stay here forever. <laughs> <laughs> a little hut out in the back. <laughs> and that's when we're really, you know, this is when when we really arrive here fully. It's 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 
really pleasurable, action, actually. No wonder we feel really sad when we lose touch with it. People often communicate that, their longing for that awakened place. <clears throat> if they've somehow, somehow it's gotten obscured. Or they might even have the belief, which isn't really true, that they lost it. I don't know if you've thought that, but how could you lose your essence? Maybe lose touch with it, but not lose it. So that's why it's helpful to come together like this, hang out, Mm -hmm. and have a clear, resonant, field of communicating in this deep way beneath the words within the words so our listening becomes an aliveness that is in sync with everything I just was remembering I think in um, I don't know if you've been to the aquarium down in Monterey I was there recently and the um, anchovies, they're like they're like silver, shimmering silver, and they move, and it's just so incredibly beautiful. <clears throat> I keep seeing that for some reason. Because when we're alive and open, we are, we shimmer. We're radiant, actually. We're, we're actually radiating light and energy. So there's really nothing to understand or figure out or fix or get rid of. Fundamentally, I mean, it's really more a surrendering, if you will, or a letting go or an opening to a welcoming. And in the process, noticing how there may be conditioning or defensiveness that keeps us from it, ironically from what we want, you know, keeps us from feeling fulfilled or happy. No blame, of course, about that. Only compassion and forgiveness, really, so that the heart can heal and open and the light can shine again. So we bring awareness to that to the unconscious part, the sort of dark side, if you will, where we've been programmed or conditioned or learned somehow to um, defend against or push away from, or to even try to grasp something, to try to hold on to something. People often have an an awakening or an opening and they they want to hold on to it. It's understandable, of course. But freedom is no holding. The absence of holding, the absence of believing, actually. Belief can bring you to a place where you become free of it, where you're actually just fully engaged. not filtering reality and giving it a meaning or an interpretation. So there's a very open-minded quality to it. Zen mind, it's been referred to, or beginner's mind. Mind that doesn't have a preconceived idea of what's happening right now. And notice, if there is one happening, there's a preconceived idea about, what the heck is he talking about? (laughs) or whatever, you know, so projection or judgment or interpretation. And just notice that's what that is. Is it true? Is it real? No, it's just a creed. It's just a construct. It's a, it's a fabrication in a way. 
So when those filters start to fall away or dissolve, we find ourselves in this closeness, this intimacy. Really, it can even be a, it can even be a love. You know, it can feel like this beautiful, high-level open-heartedness. And we realize that we're all connected. And I think that you, I'm sure you all know that when times are rough and are difficult and there's a lot of suffering, that ultimately the most important thing as a human being is love. It's the most important thing. You're with a loved one who's on the way out. And the only thing that's important is the love, nothing else, right? You know, we find that out over and over again. But can we really, do we really know how to listen to ourselves? Because I think so many of us grew up feeling unseen and unheard. You know? I mean, when I was growing up, the, the slogan was, children are to be seen and not heard. I'm not sure they were even seen, but... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they were. <laughs> they said that, but they didn't. it wasn't really happening. <laughs> I think if they really were, they would have been heard, too. <laughs> That's what we need to, to open up, to heal. So that's why being here, another beautiful, really important, essential aspect of being here is to really see yourself, to actually listen and see yourself unfiltered, unjudged, uncompared, just fully authentically as you are perfectly now. You know, we're perfect in our imperfection, actually. That's important to find out. So, and when we can really... TLC, tender loving care, compassion, gratitude for this life, even if this life is limited or challenged or difficult. <clears throat> you know, um, we begin to appreciate more deeply the richness of each moment, the miracle of this life. And then we can really feel and connect with each other. So it's not about transcending human, it's about becoming fully human. That's what I meant with my, when I wrote the title, came up with the title for that book, Ordinary Freedom, it was really, that was it. It was integrating the absolute with the relative, the divine with the ordinary. And that's, that's how it works, that's how we transform. Are healed and liberated. And that knowledge or that wisdom, the way, is within you already. It's not something that you have to learn outside of you. You might need, it might be helpful to have some mentoring or some hints, of course. You know. But the actual roadmap, the uh, the compass for that is is a built-in. It comes with the whole thing. (laughs) So how do we find our way? How do we tune into that so that we can find our way? And that's all I'm really talking about, is how to tune into that. 
you hear the words a lot, awakening and all, you know, enlightenment, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> well, what's that really referring to? What's that really referring to? Well, it's just what it's referring to is just recognition of this fundamental energy, fundamental presence, aliveness that we are. And then when it becomes conscious, it's really obvious. You know, it's like, that's it. That's it. You know, you can, it's just like, oh, wow. And it's just, it's like a kind of aha. You know, it really is. It's awe. Ah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, that's the guiding principle, and it's by its very nature a mystery. As I jokingly have said many times, I said it's, you know, that's why they call it mysticism and not answerism. <laughs> <laughs> so what wants the answers often is something that's still wanting to feel secure and be in control, which is just our human nature, and that's instinctual and understandable and forgivable, actually. But it isn't. In, but it isn't really in control, and it knows that. That's why it's so insecure. <laughs> so when one aligns with that presence. One feels really effortlessly trusting and secure automatically. And it can feel like you're being guided, like you're being held, like you're being nurtured, loved, you know, all those things. It, when I was 16, I, I had an awakening. I didn't know what happened to me, actually. I wasn't religious, actually. I wasn't really religious at all. And, uh, and but ever since then, there was the guidance that was just there. It was okay, so feel free to come up and just raise your hand. And, and uh, if you don't raise your hand, I'll call on you. <laughs> that make you anxious? <laughs> we can work on that. <laughs> And you know, there's, I also want to say something else. You know, there's no, you don't have to come up. If, you know, you don't. But you know, the other thing is that when if someone does come up, notice how listening is happening. Like you might think, oh, I, I can't relate to that person, what they're saying at all. Or you know, notice if there's, if you can also be the person up here. Because the truth is, the way this works here is that we're all really tuning in and transforming together. That's really what's happening. And so sometimes the process of the interaction can really deepen and facilitate that for everyone, not just the person who comes up with the question or the issue or whatever. So I really invite you to tune in in that way, to really listen in a way that you're not in the way. I like that. Listen in a way that you're not in the way. <laughs> Please, come on. Ah, okay. Yes and no. I can answer both sides of that. And it's a great question, and it's important, you know, but what I like to say is that as long as you're identified, when you're identified as a doer, then there is things, then there are things you can do, and that's fine. And that when you're not identified as a doer, you, you won't be doing anymore, but things will be happening. So you don't have to worry about this. People say, well, how do I do non-doing? You know, what can I do? Well, do whatever you want. Meditate, do therapy, go to yoga, you know, stand on your head, whatever. Um, you know, I mean, there's many things, so many things. Do they help? Do they not help? You know, 
But I think that where people get caught up often in this discussion is, well, let me simplify it, really simplify it. I like to simplify everything. If how, if what you apparently are doing creates it is, is a creates a kind of holding or a contraction, then that's in the way. And if what you're so-called doing facilitates an opening, then I would say that's working towards being available for grace. I had a Zen teacher, uh, Robert Aiken, well, he was a friend. He wasn't really my teacher, but we were friends. <clears throat> Robert Aiken Roshi, who had a Zen center in Hawaii. And uh, he said something once in a lecture when I was a Zen monk that I loved. He said, you know, <clears throat> Enlightenment is an accident, but meditation or zazen makes you ac- can make you accident prone. <laughs> Not necessarily, no guarantee. So you know, you hear the Zen stories of these monks sitting on the cushion. Like, well, why are we sitting here if there's no attainment? It's a koan. It's we can't really comprehend it. But is there a value in sitting? There certainly can be. Is there a value in coming here? Certainly can be. You know, and when when you're in the proximity of if you're if you're sensitive and you're available or you're opening or vulnerable in some way, you come in a place like this, something might start to permeate, start to open up the possibility on a deeper level. There was a fellow who was in an intensive I taught. In Sebastopol recently, and um, he later came to a gathering I gave down in Santa Cruz, and he said he left the intensive. I mean, he was there all day, but he left it, and he just got his car and he just started weeping and weeping and weeping. And then he realized he had, he, the way his words were, he had gone beyond bliss. I thought, great, that's our new slogan, beyond bliss. <laughs> Really, he says, then I really understood what ordinary freedom was. I really got it. You know, so you know, coming here or being things can permeate. We want instant results. We want to see the results of our efforts. That's human nature. And people can be frustrated if they've been meditating for, you know, decades or gone on countless retreats and everything else, <clears throat> and feel like, wow, I'm still caught in the same struggles and what how come I'm not making progress but how do how do they know they're not making progress see often when conditioning reappears it's actually a sign that opening and deepening is happening not that one has gone backwards or isn't progressing you can't put the flower back in the bud it doesn't grow backwards and we don't grow backwards so you know, I, when I, can I tell you one other little story? Um, <clears throat> many years ago, when I was, actually back when I was a monk, I think the Dalai Lama came to visit for the first time. And he wasn't really well known then, not here. And um, <clears throat> he gave a little talk over in Berkeley at the Nyingma Center. And I went, some of us went to it, and he was really liked him a lot. And, and he said something which I've shared before, but I'll share it here because I think it was great. He said, you know, in the West here, you have many things that can help you. He said, take advantage of as much as you can because you need all the help you can get. (laughs) I thought, I like this guy. (laughs) Not, this is the way, period, you know, Zazen or whatever. Like, yeah, it's like, and I think if we are, I say the the only clothing you need on this path are um, a lab coat and hiking boots. <laughs> you know, lab coat because you're in, you're a scientist in a laboratory and you're observing the unknown, and and also hiking boots because you're exploring unknown territory. And if you have that attitude, then there's no problem about doing. There's finding out how it works. Is letting it be revealed. 
and then and then because the the, the truth is within us and it's self evident. It isn't a, it isn't based on a belief. It isn't it isn't it isn't even in the realm of belief. It's beyond belief, way beyond belief. So I think it's fine to do anything you want, try anything you want, see what happens. Be you know be curious and willing to have your paradigm fractured or dissolved or unraveled. Now I meet people all the time whose paradigms have unraveled. You know, if I'm with people and they have an awakening, it's like, what? They didn't even know this was possible. You know? But you're tuned in. I can feel that. You know, you've got the... You, you know what we're talking about here. So if you can tune into that, yes, then the bottom line is, yes, it's just awareness of presence. Awareness of the divine or God or whatever you want to call it, right? It's just that's it. That's fundamentally all. And there is nothing to be done. That's true. So, yes, that's also true. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Sorry I couldn't hear you very well. Thank you for the question. Um, well, even as you say that, I can feel you. You know what I mean? I feel that something's, that you're acknowledging that that's important. And I think when we acknowledge what's important, um, whatever that is, there's a, there's a release that happens, an opening that can happen. I mean, I think our nature, our fundamental nature is loving when we're not defended, when we don't feel threatened, when we're not in survival mode. Do you know? When we're not in, in um, acquisition mode, accomplishment mode, which, you know, when, when we're actually just here, when we're not getting somewhere or getting away from something or going towards something, when we're really here, our heart naturally opens, is open. I don't mean the heart, the conditional heart. I mean the, uh, the, the big heart. The heart where we feel, even though I've never met you, I feel completely connected to you. You may not feel that, but that's what I'm experiencing. You know, so that's what I would call the unconditional love. And um, I think as we as we access that, which is just another facet of the sort of infinite presence that we are, really, I think it's very much a part of human healing. And um, I think love that's that, that's more in the realm of attachment. That's different. I mean, that's it's more kind of that's that's more the expression of the human being, you know. Where then, if then, if there's loss, there's grief. That's all part of it. Right? We're, in, we're in love with somebody, and it doesn't work out, or they die, or something. That it's heartbreaking. You can break. You know what I'm saying? But that heartbreak on a human level actually facilitates deepening into the big heart if one allows the heartbreak. You follow me? Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I, I think that um, we've often learned to resist heartbreak and thereby promote it in a way. I mean, or prevent ourselves from really being loved. So it's, we don't realize that when the heart breaks, it just gets bigger and bigger, and it ne- it's infinite. That's the beauty of it. So then one isn't so afraid of heartbreak anymore. It's painful. As if we're human, as a human, but it's 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 unavoidable. I mean, I think that human relationships and all of all levels of them, whether they're just you know going you know being checked out at the grocery store or your partner, your children, whatever your whatever the relationship is, um, it can be phenomenally profoundly through the. How can I just describe this? <coughs> Instrumental in liberation, opening of the big heart. Because you know, it's, it's always, there's always the opportunity for letting go of control and not dominating and not submitting either. 
but to really move into a place where we're connected. So I think relationships are one of the great years for 